Wow, there's lots of water here, too. Who's ready to rock? Those are the right words. Wow. Hi, guys. I'm going to be here for the next hour. Woo. Oh, okay. Maybe less enthusiastic about that one. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, my name is Seth. I'm going to talk about amygdala low jacking. You've probably heard of amygdala hijacking, which is super cool. We had a keynote on it and a little bit of a conversation about that for during the last talk. Uh, you'll note that the low jacking is spelled with a W so that we can avoid any copyright claims. Uh, that is a trademarked thing, so I'm not using that. Unless, of course, they spell theirs with a W and I forgot. In which case, I'll go back and change it later. Um, anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing is my disclaimer. I usually include this in all of my talks. Uh, I'm not responsible for you taking the things that I teach you here and doing harmful things. Uh, please don't use these things to break the law. You should probably consult with an attorney before you do that. I'm not actually an attorney, but I may play one at SaintCon. And the purpose of this presentation is to teach you how to manage the risk for your social engineering vulnerabilities, not to teach you how to break the law. You could potentially use it for both, uh, although this talk is more toward defense. Uh, anyway, now that we've got that taken care of, it's uh, story time with Seth. For those of you who work with me, you get this maybe a little bit more frequently. And uh, today, I'm going to do a slight experiment with the way that we're going to do this. So we're going to try this out. I want to do a little bit of choose your own adventure. You can read along with me in your book. You will know it is time to turn the page when you hear the chimes ring like this. All right, so. Let's talk about stories that you want to hear. How many of you want to hear the story of the crazy uh, home improvement store that we cannot name guy? How many of you have heard that story before? How many of you have not heard that story? It's really hard to see. How many of you want to hear the story no matter what? Great, okay, we're all good. All right, so uh, this is one of my favorite stories to tell because it talks about uh, amygdala hijacking and social engineering. And it talks about a particular target who uh, studies social engineering a lot. That's me. I was the guy who got owned in this situation. And uh, <clears throat> in this particular case, I, uh, it, it was around Christmas time. And I had Christmas lights on my house because my kids love them. And I just got sick of having to go out every night and plug those darn things in. I'm just lazy. It is what it is. But they want them on every night because it makes them feel happy about the Christmas time thing. And so I said, there's technology for this. I can solve this problem. So what I wanted to do was go to my favorite home improvement store, which will not be named, and buy for myself a sensor that can detect dark and light that automatically turns on Christmas lights. Super easy to do. And uh, my best friend came by, and we were going to hang out. And I said, hey, man, can we, can we go to this store and pick up this thing before we go out to eat and do all of our other stuff? He's like, sure, we can do that. So I go to the home improvement store. And the location of this thing that I want to purchase is like the milk in the grocery store. You have to go all the way to the back and all the way to the end of the store to get there. And so we're walking through the store all the way to the end and all the way to the back. And it's important because it's in the back for the story. Uh, and when we get close to this area, I can see where I'm supposed to go. And there's a gentleman there. I call him Crazy Home Improvement Guy. He's got two full-size Huskies with him in the store. And he's doing an activity that I like to call holding an employee hostage. Uh, you may not know this, but people who are paid to help you answer your questions have to sit there and listen to you when you're continuing to ask questions. And th the employee is clearly annoyed because these questions keep going on and on and on. He's got, like, stocking work to do, or I don't know what, but he needs to be getting back to actual work, but he can't because this man is holding him hostage. Should have been a red flag for me, but, you know, I, I didn't pay attention. So I decided to walk up and, you know, sneak behind and, and grab one of these things off the shelf. As I'm getting closer, 
He stops mid-sentence, turns around, points straight at me and says, you, you're the one who did it. You shot that guy in a gang fight in Park City. All right, next story. Uh, how many of you want to hear the story of the magical mystery sound clue in my house? All right, we'll do that one too. So uh, in my house, it's late at night, I put all my kids to bed, uh, my wife's out with her friends, and I hear this scratching sound, or at least I thought it was scratching. And I said to myself, well, it's probably just my kids getting up. So I go downstairs to check. I check on every single one of my children. They're all totally asleep. Then I come back upstairs. I'm like, oh, well, it, was just, it was just a thing, right? So I'm going to go back to working on my slides for this presentation. And the sound happens again. It's driving me crazy. So I look all over the house and cannot find the origin of this sound. And then I decide to place myself strategically in the center of the house where I can like point my ears in every direction where there's like a hallway or something to try and hear this sound. All right, next story. Who wants to hear the story of me trying to build the wireless hunt? Yes, okay, all right. So uh, I don't know if you know about the wireless hunt. It's a challenge here at St. Con. It's new. I came up with it. It's crazy, and I hope that you have fun with it. Uh, it turns out that when I was trying to place some of the devices as part of the wireless hunt, I had an appointment to install it at a location. I was on a really close timeline because I had to help with the registration here and then get to that location, which will not be disclosed in this talk, uh, to deposit this item. And as I did so, Part of it broke. Uh, when you're on a timeline, a fixed timeline, there's a lot of pressure to make sure that you are on time, especially when someone's doing a great favor for you. And so I really wanted to be on time. Showed up in the parking lot and my device is broken. Uh, I had to hurry and fix it. So let's move to the next story. Who wants to hear about the wildfires here in Utah County? One guy? No? Two guys, okay, moving on. All right, who wants to hear about my favorite Lord of the Rings character? Lord of the Rings fans out there? How many of you are fans of the movies? How many of you are fans of the books? All right, you guys are my friends. My favorite character in Lord of the Rings is that guy right there, Faramir. How many of you who are fans of the books know why? Yes. He was maybe the best character in the whole survey. That's not why. Remember, I'm a social engineer. N no, 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 no. It's because there's a difference between the characterization of Faramir in the movie and in the books. And if you are a really big fan of the books, and someone brings that up and you say, my favorite character in the movie was Faramir, smoke billows out of their ears. It's like they blow up inside. It's crazy but I love it. Anyway, so he's my favorite Lord of the Rings character. All right, so now let's get to some serious stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about the amygdala, and I don't mean the Batman kind of quasi weirdo villain that had his amygdala removed. Uh, apparently his name is amygdala, and when you have your amygdala removed, I don't think it turns you into a big red monster, but could be mistaken. Comics are awesome. So this is your brain, or a picture of a brain. And uh, your brain is really great. It has a piece inside of it called the amygdala. It's used to process emotional response and fight or flight responses. How many of you have had one of those? Okay, if you're not raising your hand, you probably don't understand the question because you've definitely had one. How many of you are having one right now when I ask you to raise your hand? <laughs> yeah, so uh, you've got a bunch of different pieces of the brain, but the, the ones that are important are the thalamus, which processes inputs from sensory organs. And uh, Bonnie, in our keynote this year, talked a lot about some of this stuff. Uh, fascinating talk. If you haven't heard her talk, you should go back and listen to the recording because it's fantastic. But uh, once that information is processed, then it goes into the amygdala and into the neocortex. The amygdala is responsible for things 
that uh, deal with fight or flight and emotion. Whenever you feel something, the amygdala is involved. And whenever you are processing things through some sort of like cognitive process, then your neocortex is involved. And those are essentially two different paths for your ability to process information and make decisions. And they work very differently uh, as opposed to each other. So uh, one of the things that you should know about your amygdala is it's really awesome. It is the Usain Bolt of parts of your brain. And I say that because it's really, really, really fast. Uh, you can see these people here racing against Usain Bolt. They're also really, really, really fast, probably faster than all of us in this room. And yet Usain Bolt is somehow not only ahead of them, but leaning over to the camera and smiling. Uh, which, by the way, you know, foot speed record for humans held by that man, uh, awesome job, fab fabulous runner. Uh, your amygdala is like that. So when signals come in from the thalamus and they're sent out to the amygdala and the neocortex, and then those devices process all this stuff kind of black boxy and send do this to the rest of your brain later on, the amygdala always wins that race. Always. It is milliseconds faster than the neocortex. It's just biologically that way, and there's been a lot of research done on that. And when uh, that research was published, uh, a journalist by the last name of Golden wrote a book about some of the things that he learned from reading some of these scientific studies, and in that he coined the term amygdala hijacking. And amygdala hijacking specifically refers to this concept of how when the signals come in, if you hit the amygdala and the amygdala triggers some sort of fight or flight response, that wins every single time because it's faster. All right, so uh, emotions can do crazy things. And in the words of Yoda, fear is the path to the dark side. When you have a fearful response, fight or flight response, it may not lead to anger, hate, or suffering, but it can lead to really bad decisions because all the rational parts of you are just a couple seconds later. It takes a little bit longer to do that. Any questions about that? Does that make sense? I know that was like deep science-y stuff. We're good? Okay. All right, so let's talk about strategies that you can use to kind of fix this for yourself. Uh, how many of you are Space Invaders fans? Okay, you get the strategy joke here. That's great, all right. So uh, I would like to present a sort of model that you can use to try and help yourself to figure out how to manage this particular awesomeness that is your brain. So there are three main parts of the brain that I wanna talk about. And uh, this deals with more of a psychological theory than it does with actual uh, biology of the brain, but the biology of the brain is involved. So you have the neocortex, that's the cognitive part of the brain, that does the rational thinking. You have the limbic system, of which the amygdala is part. It's the affective part of the brain, very uh, full of emotion. And then the primal brain, the conative brain, that's the part of the brain that lets you do things, like move your arm and stuff. Uh, so I would like to suggest that you can use each of these parts of, the, of your brain and you can use your psychological gifts that are given by these three things to be able to control some of your risk for social engineering and amygdala hijacking. So the first thing we want to talk about is feelings and emotions. How many of you have feelings? Okay, a couple of sociopaths in here. Nice to meet you. Uh, having feelings is great. It's very awesome. Uh, there is kind of a grammatical difference between affect and effect. We're not talking about either of those things today. We're talking about affect, which is a psychological concept related to feelings and the way that that processes inside of your brain. Uh, the first technique that I want you to learn is to search your feelings. Let Darth Vader help you out here. Search your feelings, you know it to be true. Uh, I want you to take a little bit of a swim in Lake U and figure out what are the feelings that I'm having. Uh, the more often you do this, the more you will recognize what feelings are. 
And I know this sounds weird to have at a security conference, but feelings motivate you to do something. You had a feeling that there would be some sort of positive reward for coming to this talk. I can't imagine what that would be. But you came here, like you walked up to this room, sat down, and you're listening to me now because of a feeling. So take the advice of Darth Vader, search your feelings, and figure out if you can understand some of the reasons behind that. Uh, the next thing is to talk about your feelings. How many of you are fans of Mr. Rogers? He's making an appearance in our slides here today. Yeah, Mr. Rogers, great, great man. Did a lot of children's television for a number of years. Uh, and he talked about the importance of discussing feelings. Uh, he did a lot of research on those kinds of things, but if you don't have the chance to talk about your feelings, I would suggest that you find someone with whom you can. Uh, the ability to talk about your feelings will help you to understand the way that you feel better and will help you to manage your amygdala better than you would otherwise. All right, so let's talk about the next part of the brain. We're going to talk about the cognitive part of the brain. Uh, so those of you who are really good at cognition, head to your mind palace right now. Uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is having an internal retrospective where you think about the feelings that you have had and maybe some of the things that contributed to having those feelings or what happened as a result of those feelings. Uh, it turns out that our brains are hardwired to memorize things and some of those pathways get really well established, especially when they're emotional responses. If you recognize that you're having a pathway built, you can choose whether or not you want to devote energy to that pathway or try to divert energy away from that pathway if possible. Then the next thing is introspection, looking inside of something. Look inside of some of the motivations behind some of the emotions that you're feeling and see if you can find causes. Uh, you should also make sure that you <laughs> have a strong link between all the things that you are discussing. Try and put those together, not have the breakage that could possibly happen between the emotional response that you have and the trigger that's associated with that. Uh, you should also look for patterns. Uh, I don't know what pattern is represented here, but I can assure you that your brain is really good at patterns and not just recognizing patterns, but making patterns. Uh, if you have a phobia of the dark, there's a pattern there where when you go into a dark room, your amygdala says, fight or flight. Let me get out. If you have a phobia of heights and you're up on a high spot, your amygdala says, let me get out. If you can recognize those kinds of patterns in everyday life where your amygdala gets triggered, then you have a better chance of being able to understand it and control it. Uh, you should know all the triggers that happen inside of your own brain. When you have a trigger inside your brain and you know that that can trigger something, you can avoid having that trigger or train yourself to hopefully get around it. There are lots of things that you can do to manage that. And then the last thing that I want to talk about from a cognitive perspective is threat modeling. How many of you, from a security perspective, know what threat modeling is? Three of you. Great. Okay, we're going to talk about threat modeling for just a moment. Uh, how many of you drove to this facility? How many of you decided that it was not worth driving down Center Street because the speed limit is very low on Center Street and you took a different road? That's threat modeling. All you have to do is recognize what are the potential risks out there and figure out a plan to mitigate those risks. Does that make sense? All right. Um, other questions? Anyone have a question about threat modeling or cognitive stuff before we move on? No? All right. Okay. Then the last part is the cognitive or behavioral part to psychology. This is where you do things, and Shia LaBeouf is going to tell you to just do it. You should do things about this. Uh, one of the first things that I think is really important to be able to manage your risk as part of your amygdala hijacking is to journal or write down the things that you know happen. Once we've gone through the cognitive process of identifying patterns and triggers and pathways and things like that, you should write down the things that you have felt, the things that you know triggered those things, and be able to make yourself have a greater consciousness or awareness of those things. Uh, you can also write down some experiments that you are trying to be able to control some of those emotional responses and be able to use that as far as making sure that you're following the pathway that you've established for yourself. 
Next is to have a plan. Uh, you want to make sure that you continually improve your plan as you go on. Uh, planning to make a plan isn't a plan, but having a plan, even if it's very simple and trying to execute on that, does work. This is goal setting. I if you set a goal and you actively work toward it, your chances of achieving that goal are greater simply because you have written it down and you're actively working toward it. There's a lot of theory that goes into making goals. I'm not going to talk a lot about that today, other than I would suggest that you probably set some very specific goals for yourself and make sure that you have a pathway to achieve them and that you check back with someone to make sure that you are achieving them, even if that person is yourself, or preferably have someone else hold you responsible for the achievement of those goals. Next thing I want to talk about is practice. Alan Iverson decided to talk a little bit about practice, or didn't want to talk about practice, but we're going to talk about practice today. You should practice doing the kinds of things that help you to control your feelings. How many of you have done a social engineering experiment with a friend before? Two of you. How many of you have been the target of a social engineering experiment? Everyone can raise your hand. I'm doing it right now. That's okay. Uh, if you have not tried to understand what social engineering does for you, I would suggest that now is the time to do that. If you want to minimize your risk as far as amygdala hijacking and social engineering, you need to know what kinds of things happen that can create those situations. Uh, I think it's unlikely that you'll ever be able to practice a situation with the crazy home improvement store guy, because that's weird, but you can practice normal everyday things that do trigger emotional responses for you, and if you do so, you can have better control over those uh, outcomes. Uh, the next thing is look out for traps. If you know that there is a trap that can ensnare you in some sort of amygdala hijacking, or strong affect, as it's called in psychology, then you can avoid those things. Uh, you don't need to sit outside the Death Star and wait for the you know, shields to go down, hoping that it's going to be OK, if you know that it's a trap. All right, so are we ready to do a little bit more story time, finish up our stories? We're going to get there, I promise. All the stories. All right, so my favorite Lord of the Rings character, Faramir. I love having this conversation, and I was actually tempted to bring one of you up on stage. He's a really, really big fan of the books. I love talking about Faramir just for this purpose. It's fantastic to see how emotionally built up people can be over the movie did it differently than the book did. But here's the reality. Every single one of us has those kinds of passions. Maybe the Lord of the Rings is not your thing. If it is, then be careful when people talk about Lord of the Rings, like right now. But if it isn't, you also have a trigger. You have a thing that's like Lord of the Rings. You have something that you passionately care about. And whenever someone stomps on that, or talks about that in a flippant way, or a way that you don't agree with, you lose it. I promise you do. You totally do. And there is not a whole lot that happens to fix that problem unless you understand how those pathways work and how to control those emotions. Now, some of you may have learned how to control your Lord of the Rings response, or maybe you're not as big a fan of the, of the book as other people. But when you encounter one of these scenarios, you get to choose. When you recognize I just got hijacked by someone who talked about a movie and now I lost my cool, then you can choose to say, maybe I don't want to do that next time. Maybe I wanted to say, I'm not going to talk about Lord of the Rings right now. I just hate that movie. Okay? All right, so we decided not to talk about wildfires. I think we decided not to talk about wildfires. Okay, wireless hunt. So I ended up rebuilding this wireless device in the parking lot. And I mean, I wish it weren't true, but amygdala hijacking happens even when there's no one else around. Like just the pressure of knowing that there's a timeline involved and I have to get this done and I have to get back to the conference and there's all this stuff that's going on. How many of you felt those things? Like, man, I gotta get this job done. I gotta help out my family or do this thing for work. And if I don't get it by this deadline, I might get fired. 
Well, that's what I felt like. And guess what? Whenever you're in that state, your amygdala is working overtime. And your cognitive brain is like, hey, I want to turn. And that's what happened to me. It took me an hour and a half. It was in the parking lot, but it took me an hour and a half to fix something that wasn't really a problem because I didn't pay attention to some of the little clues that I had left for myself. And over and over and over again, I kept trying the same thing. Like, why does this not work? Why can't I get this Wi-Fi access point up? I did get it up. It's totally working. You should try the Wi-Fi hunt. And I hope that it's fun for you. Uh, it was fun to make. Uh, by the way, it's downstairs in floor one next to the flag where it says wireless hunt. If you haven't started yet, uh, you should probably start that before you leave the building today if you want to do that. Uh, and then the sound, the mystery clue that was in my house uh, two weeks ago. So I went to go check on my kids. None of them were awake. They weren't making that sound. I looked all around, couldn't find it. Then the sound happened again. So I placed myself strategically in such a way that I can hear every direction in my house. I'm next to every hallway, spinning my ears around. It's just super quiet. I'm thinking, nah, maybe... Maybe it's gone, whatever it is. And then right at that moment, I hear the sound directly over my head. Nearly jumped out of my skin with a fight or flight response. It was one of those little Glade spray battery powered things. Yeah, no joke. I got owned by the Glade company because I thought my kids were awake. And I had a fight or flight response in that moment. It was great that no one else was there to see, but now that I'm telling everyone, I guess there's that. All right, so <clears throat> the uh, home improvement store guy. So I came home, well, I, I came to the store, and I'm trying to get this thing, and he turns to me and he says, you, you're the one who killed that guy in that gang fight in Park City. And I'm like, I, no, dude, I'm sure it's not me. Like, I'm a pacifist, I don't own firearms. Uh, pretty sure you got the wrong guy, trying to like squeeze past him. And he moves his dogs over so that I have to go even farther around. He's like, no, I'm absolutely sure it was you. You shot that guy in that bar, there was blood everywhere. I'm like, no, dude. And I'm starting to get, you know, a little crazy because my amygdala is like, no, I'm not a murderer, right? Emotional response, and he's very insistent. And I'm trying to grab this thing. I finally get a hold of it. He's like, I promise that was you. There was blood everywhere. They carried that guy out on a stretcher. And my best friend who's with me, my best friend says, oh, yeah, he did it. I was there, too. <laughs> he totally did it. I had to be the getaway driver. I left Home Depot, uh, the home improvement store. I left that store screaming at the top of my lungs, I am not a murderer. I'm surprised I did not get kicked out of that store in perpetuity. And I was owned by some crazy guy at a home improvement store. I study social engineering. I give talks like this on a regular basis. This is what, my fourth at St. Con. And it didn't matter because I encountered a new situation that I had never encountered before in my entire life. I had never been accused of murder in a home improvement store. Now, there will always be some amount of risk associated with amygdala hijacking. There always is. You will always have the opportunity to come into new situations that you are definitely not prepared for. And you will be faced with the possibility of an emotional response. Uh, some might be more pronounced than others. It's probably unlikely that you will be screaming and yelling, I'm not a murderer, but maybe. Uh, in the event that that happens, Having a better handle on how you process emotions and understanding when that happens and being able to check yourself or having a peer there who doesn't say, yeah, he did it, but helps you to get through that moment might be really helpful. Uh, and then, uh, of course, using the techniques that we have talked about here can help you to prepare for those situations in many different ways. This isn't necessarily a, if you do this one thing or you check this box, you'll be safe. Uh, I want to suggest that the, the model that I've proposed here is something that will take work. It will take time. If you do it over time, you will get much, much better at it. And then you will get to scenarios where in normal situations, normal people will have that emotional response, but you will not. Um, that's the end of my remarks for right now. Uh, I'd like to take questions if you have them.
So, shoot. Yes. So my interest in the amygdala and social engineering, I don't know, I mean, I guess we could go back to my childhood and things that happened in my childhood, but we probably don't want to talk about that now. That's poor OPSEC. Uh, absolutely, and in fact, in, in other talks, I, I, uh, I talk about experiments that I've done with uh, myself and others to try and find out um, like what happens when you do this thing with this person or these people. Um, I talk about the holding out an object in a tray in front of someone, like push pins. How many of you have heard that story? I was bored at work one day, and I had a box of push pins on my desk, so I flipped open the lid, walked around to people, and just held it out in front of them. You'd be surprised, every single person takes one. And then they ask me after the fact, why do I have this? <laughs> the, like the power of suggestion is really powerful. None of them said, I don't want that, or why are you holding that in front of me? Because you know, when someone holds something in front of you, typically if it's open and it's a container full of things, you just take one. Uh, you wanna have a really successful experiment, put food there. Unless it's something that someone's like deathly allergic to, they'll always take one. Even if they don't eat it, they'll be like, oh, thanks. Right? You can make that happen. Um, signs, we, uh, I talk about placing a sign like do not move, thanks, management, on a, a piece of ductwork, a pipe, setting it in the middle of a hallway, in the middle of the workplace. No one will move it. They're too afraid. Even the manager is too afraid. Uh, we stuck it in front of the manager's office for a while, and she had to like shimmy through the door to get by it uh, for a week. And no one said anything. And then, you know, af after a while, the joke is done, and you're like, Shh, that was funny. But So uh, I don't know. I've always been interested in this. Uh, I, I love the way the human brain works. And uh, a lot of the talks that you might hear it in, in this kind of venue will talk about how uh, humans are broken or stupid or uh, the last talk about being the weakest link. Uh, I believe that... Being emotionally centered is good. And there are some complexities there that uh, I mean, we could talk about for hours after this. But uh, I believe that it's good to be emotionally centered rather than rationally centered. But balancing those things out is really important. And so uh, I sometimes wonder if I tilt too far one way or the other. Sometimes I feel like I'm cutting down emotions in some of my experiments and I don't want to feel anything and I wonder if I am a sociopath. And other times I, I, th I think, man, I'm just I'm feeling so much that I lost my cool in a home improvement store. What's going on, right? Uh, but this, I mean, this is a human experience. We all have this. We all have these parts of the brain, except for the Batman villain. We all have these parts of the brain and so it happens to all of us. And there's this back and forth, and when you do things or think things or feel things, those things are all interrelated, and you know, modern science studies these things, modern psychology studies these things, and we still don't really know how the human brain works as well as we would like. We know a lot of, about it, but we don't know as much as we want. Uh, there is a wealth of information out there uh, about how the human brain works. There was a great talk in the keynote, um, Bonnie is doing some incredible research there. Uh, but it doesn't have to be limited just to the people who have a full-time job doing research at a university, uh, in, in my opinion. I, I believe that you, too, can, can do social engineering experiments, hopefully not on the scale of like Facebook experimenting with emotions and making people feel sad without their express consent, even though I guess you kind of sort of agree to that. But like Facebook did that and then got some backlash, and now everything's OK because they're Facebook or something. Uh, I would suggest don't do that. That seems a bit unethical to me, but uh, maybe talk with some friends and figure out how did I ha handle the situation? What were my emotions that you saw expressed? And did
did I overreact? Did I have this strong affect or amygdala hijacking situation? And what would you suggest I do next time? Does that answer your question? Okay, other questions, yes? Uh, as far as like amygdala hijacking or in general? So you know you're going to your parents for Thanksgiving, but because you cut and all kinds of things out, you have a certain <laughs> event in the future. That's a great question. So do I do threat modeling when I'm going to mom and dad's for Thanksgiving dinner and there's going to be like the family tension there? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So um, for me personally, uh, to be honest, it's kind of hard to turn off at this point. Like, it's just such a regular thing for me. Uh, coming up to give this talk, I'm doing threat modeling of like, how's this gonna play out? Uh, some of my talk was actually crowdsourced last night at the swimming pool, which is the weird stuff that you probably did or did not like. Um, some of it might not play well with this group, and like, it's hard to gauge the age group and everything, so I'm trying to figure that out. Uh, for sure, I threat model when I'm going to like family gatherings, and I know like, this person and this person don't get along, and so if I see them there, I might want to just walk away or something. And I think that a lot of us kind of do this innately, um, maybe not to the crazy level of paranoia like someone such as me, but I, I think we do that probably more frequently than we're led to believe. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, it's, it's not just about like, hey, I don't want to talk to that person, but if you are doing active threat modeling and you're trying to like improve your model as time goes on, then you would have to maybe keep records of information that you have and be able to analyze that in the future. Uh, I do that less frequently and perhaps not in family gatherings. <laughs> like I don't have a dossier on every family member like, oh, they, that guy hates that guy. But maybe, that's, maybe I should try it, maybe I will. That's, that's an interesting suggestion. Uh, Thanksgiving is coming up, so I'll put that on my list of things to consider. Anyone else? You guys know all about amygdala hijacking. Do you feel confident to be able to try some of these things? No? Yes, maybe? Who wants to try one today? Okay, who wants to try one right now? Do you want to come up on stage? We're going to do this live. All right, this is going to be super interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not prepared for this. I know, right? Did you see my amygdala flare up when I'm like, okay, we're going to do this? You want to talk about Thanksgiving? Do I have to? It, if you want to. Uh, so what amygdala hijacking situation do you want to solve? How about that? What amygdala hijacking situation? Like, have you ever had an emotional response that you really wanted to not have? Personally? Sure. If you're comfortable sharing with the group, because it's me and, like, I don't know, X hundred of my closest friends at Sankon. Um. I probably might have been able to think of one while I was sitting down, but now up on but stage, now everything you shifts. Yeah. Okay, so there, ladies there's, and, a, there's a one right there. Ladies and gentlemen, amygdala hijacking. <laughs> Can he <laughs> rationally think right now? No, he can't, right? Um, he did not know in advance that he was going to be coming up here on stage, and even when he volunteered to do that, he was okay and safe in his seat, but standing up here and be like, hey, do you want to disclose personal information? Yeah. And like you, when you see the conversation like that, Man, it seems a whole lot more intense, right? And you feel that. Yeah, anonymity of the crowd slows things down uh, in your perception. It gives you more time to sort of feel like you think, but once you're up here, it's gone. <laughs> yeah, all right. Thank you very much. Ooh. You can get back down now. I'm not going to torture you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this guy. What's your name? Sean. Sean, yeah. Sean, uh, I, I don't know Sean. I've never met Sean. I didn't ask him to do that. There'll be something for you later, Sean. Um, any other questions, or are we good? So bright. We're good? All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Have a nice day at SyncCon.